The first thing that you usually want to do with an integral is make sure that a simple u substitution isn't going to work. And if we do try u substitution, you should notice pretty quickly that that's not going to work out so well. So I'll cross that out. And the next thing that you might notice is that we have an x squared and some other term under a square root, and it's in the denominator of our integral. And the question that we should be asking is, can we rewrite this denominator in this form here, or in some form that looks like that? And in this example, the algebra trick that we need to do is completing the square. And the short explanation of how to do this is just to look at these first two terms and come up with some constant that we could add so that we could then rewrite those first three terms as a perfect square. And if you're pretty good at seeing into the future, you can see that if we have these first two terms and we want to write those first two terms with some other constant as a perfect square, that perfect square is going to have to look like that. Meaning that this constant right here is just going to have to be a 9. Now if just looking at that and figuring it out doesn't make sense, what you can do when finding this number in completing the square is you can take the b term, which in this case happens to be negative 6, you can divide it by 2 and you can square it. So in this example, negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3, and if we square that, we get 9. Well, okay, however you get that plus 9, that's an illegal maneuver unless you subtract 9 as well. Then what you'll notice is that these first three terms are a perfect square. They create this perfect square right here. As far as that minus 9, well, we just have to keep it. So we just did all of that work just so we could rewrite that denominator. That x squared minus 6x can now be written as x minus 3 squared minus 9. Now this denominator looks a lot more like this form with an a equals 3, but instead of x squared, we have x minus 3 squared in our integral. So instead of x equals 3 secant theta, we're going to use the substitution x minus 3 equals 3 secant theta. Taking a derivative of both sides of this is going to give us dx. You'll notice that the constant 3 right here goes to 0, and the derivative of 3 secant theta is 3 secant tangent. Now let's plug those substitutions in and get to work on this integral. As as always, we can simplify what's under the square root. And as always, we can recall the appropriate trigonometric identity. In this case, 9 secant squared theta minus 9 can be turned into 9 tangent squared theta. We can then simplify that square root, keeping in mind that technically this would be an absolute value of tangent of x. But as we've explained in most of these other videos, we're going to assume that tangent of theta is greater than 0. And we can get rid of these absolute values and cancel the tangent from the numerator and the denominator, cancel the 3 from the numerator in the denominator, and we are just left with an integral of secant, which in most cases, I think we just look up in a table. But if you're curious as to where that table entry comes from, we make u something that isn't even in the integral, which is super interesting. And when we find du and do a little bit of algebra, we can notice that du over u is the same thing as secant theta. It's kind of cool. When you divide du by u, the secant plus tangent just cancels out, and you're just left with secant theta d theta, which is our integrand. That then gives us an integral of du over u, which is the natural log of u. And since u was secant theta plus tangent theta, uh, that's the result that we get for the integral of secant d theta. Anyway, I think that most of the time people just look that integral up. But at this point, as always, we're left wondering how do we get rid of the thetas and get back to the x's that we started with? And to do that, we need to look back at our very first substitution. It was this right here. And if we divide both sides by 3, we get that the secant of an angle theta is x minus 3 over 3. If we draw a right triangle with theta down here, and recall that secant is 1 over cosine, which is hypotenuse over adjacent, we can label then the hypotenuse with x minus 3 and the adjacent side with 3. And the old Pythagorean theorem is going to tell us that this last side looks like this. And if you actually multiply it out and simplify, there's that familiar x squared minus 6x. So what we can do is rewrite our answer now. In this triangle, the secant of theta, well, I guess we already knew the secant of theta was x minus 3 over 3. But now we know that the tangent of theta, which is opposite over adjacent, is the square root of x squared minus 6x over 3. And I think that that's a pretty good answer. Though in case maybe the back of your book or your answer key says something different, let's play around with this just a little bit. You'll notice that these two terms have a common denominator, so we can combine them. And maybe you'll recall this rule for logarithms. It says, if you have a quotient inside of a logarithm, you can split that logarithm up into two pieces and subtract. Now, this is looking pretty good. Notice that the natural log of 3 is just some constant. If we start with some random constant that we don't know and subtract some other constant, the natural log of 3, well, we're still left with some constant that we don't know. So we can just call this whole number out here, whatever it is, just C1 maybe. And we can write this as our final answer. And I think that that looks like a pretty nice answer. Okay, these problems are getting pretty good. I'm going to zoom out so you can see the whole thing. And as always, I'm going to scroll through the work so that you can take another quick look at it. As always, just hit pause in your browser whenever you want to stop this thing. 
But I hope this video helped you out, and I hope to see you in the next one.